things like jigs and fast dances. Ragtime was a transient genre. It was popular before recorded music became available, meaning it was mainly distributed uh, via sheet music. So you'd hear it performed at bars and clubs, but you could also like buy the published sheet music. And this is something it had in common with classical music before it. But the sound of ragtime was evolving away from the classical sound, and it can be seen as a precursor to jazz, which came afterwards. With jazz, the musical landscape changed even further in the advent of musical recordings. When we talk about influential composers of ragtime music, we have to talk about the, the big three. These are the three men who we call the greats of ragtime. So they would be Scott Joplin, who we're going to talk about first, and then we have Joseph Lamb and James Scott. So these were composers who enjoyed popularity, and they wrote high-level ragtime music, not the cheap imitation ragtime that you know came along with the whole package. So let's start this off by talking about Scott Joplin. He was an African-American songwriter and piano player, like all these ragtime greats, and born in 1867 in Texas, although he later lived in Missouri, where which was kind of like the hub of ragtime music. He grew up as a railway laborer, but he was lucky enough to have a musical family and good teachers who helped him out because he was able to travel around the South as a musician after deciding as an adult that hard physical labor wasn't seven or and piano player, like all these ragtime greats, and born in 1867 in Texas, although he later lived in Missouri where which was kind of like the hub of ragtime music. He grew up as a railway laborer, but he was lucky enough to have a musical family and good teachers who helped him out because he was able to travel around the South as a musician after deciding as an adult that hard physical labor wasn't his cup of tea. So he moved to Sedalia, Missouri, later lived in St. Louis as well, um, and he taught piano for a living you know, training future ragtime stars, no big deal. And he also started publishing music when he lived in Missouri. And in 1899, he got a publishing deal with his song, Maple Leaf Ray, which became basically like the quintessential ragtime piece. Most people have heard it. It's basically the most famous ragtime song that exists. We're gonna listen to a quick clip of the Maple Leaf Ray. And I want you to pay attention to the very steady left hand combined with sort of that syncopated, bouncy, or lighter right hand. In Sedalia, there was a club called the Maple Leaf Club, and that's actually where the name of this song came from because it was a club that Joplin went to, and he named his song after that, the Maple Leaf Ray. to St. Louis and New York, and he spent the remainder of his life trying to break out of the rank time box that he had been put in due to popularity. He composed other things like operas, but never really had a lot of success with them. So in 1917, he died because of syphilis, and with him, ragtime sort of died too. That was that was basically the end of ragtime, the beginning of jazz. Then we have Joseph Lamb, the second of the big three. He was born about 20 years later than Joplin, and he was born on the East Coast, so he wasn't anywhere nearby, like the main scene of ragtime, but he was still deeply influenced by it. And as a self-taught piano player, he was super passionate about Joplin's music. So in 1907, his like fanboy fantasies came to life and he met Joplin in New York City. Joplin was impressed with Flem's music, so Joplin was like, hey, I'm going to hook you up with my publisher. And then Joseph Flem had the same publisher and stayed with him for about a decade. So around the time of Joplin's death in 1917, and at the end of the ragtime era, Lamb was kind of like, well, you know what, let's just make this music thing a hobby. I'm going to be an accountant instead. The song I want to show you by Joseph Lamb is his Sensation Rag. This is the one that he performed for Scott Joplin in person in 1908, the one that 
got him referred to Joplin's publicist and allowed for you know him to compose more and enjoy more fame. Joseph Lamb's rags aren't super super complex, but they're highly organized. He was one of those musicians who believed in melody first and complexity second. So as a listener, it's not like going to be really emotionally investing music, but it's very very listenable and accessible. piano player and composer who lived in Missouri, just like Scott Joplin. And like Joseph Lamb, James Scott was born about 20 years after Joplin, and he was like, you know, Joplin was his idol. So in 1905, he actually went on a little travel adventure, or supposedly, this isn't like a confirmed fact, but okay, so supposedly he traveled to St. Louis to meet up with Joplin and play some rags for him. And just like with Joseph Lamb, Joplin was like, hey, you're pretty good, kid, and then he recommended James Scott to his publisher. So Scott was a composer, he composed a bunch of famous rags, he became a music teacher, and one thing that he mainly did to earn an income was performing at silent movies. But when sound movies started becoming a thing in the early 1930s, that kind of pushed him out of his main source of income of performing at silent movies. So he died a lot more broken destitute than he lived. Scott wrote a song called The Frog Legs Rag, which enjoyed immense popularity. It wasn't quite as popular as Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag, but it was definitely like way up there. And this is one of his earlier compositions, but I wanted to show it to you because this is the one he maybe performed for Joplin to get a publishing deal, kind of like Lamb who we were just talking about. And it gives you a sense of his clear and uh, energetic songwriting style. example of this is Debussy's Gollywog's Cakewalk, which is from his collection called uh, Children's Corner, and it was written in 1913. Now, cakewalks were pretty similar to rags. We already kind of mentioned them a little bit. They were more of like a ragtime precursor. You should definitely listen to Gollywog's Cakewalk. We won't. It's beyond the scope of the video to do a clip of that now, especially because it doesn't pertain specifically to ragtime, but it's really good. You should look it up. Like any new and exciting musical genres, not everyone is going to be singing its praises. It's kind of like you know, Marilyn Manson in the 1990s, everyone thought he was like satanic and all that, like it was evil music. The same was said about Ragtime when it first came out. It was considered by some to be musical poison and of being able to find its way into the brains of the youth to such an extent as to arouse one's suspicions of their sanity. So basically it just goes to show that no matter what generation you are living in, new and exciting music is often considered evil until it becomes more mainstream. Though Ragtime fell out of popularity around 1920, being replaced by the wilder, more adventurous jazz styles, Ragtime didn't disappear into obscurity forever. In the 1970s, Ragtime music was revived by performers and movies. So one thing that happened to Ragtime over the years was that it sort of became caricaturized. You had this art form that was then watered down for mass consumption, as tends to happen, and then it became parodied over the years. So then no one ever, no one considered it a serious genre of music anymore, like in the 40s, 50s. Typical impressions of Ragtime music would involve playing on an out of two piano, playing way too fast, making lots of mistakes, and so on. But in the 1970s, there was a guy named Joshua Rimkin, and he recorded an album called Piano Rags by Scott Joplin. And he approached it like a classical piano player and treated the genre with actual respect. And this album became really popular, helped um, popularize ragtime in mass culture again, 
And then other things as well help repopularize right time, like the 1974 movie called The Sting, which used and featured the music of Scott Joplin. It's actually from this movie that the Scott Joplin song The Entertainer became famous, which you probably heard before. And we may or may not be looking at in the next video. Because of these revitalizing efforts and many others of its ilk, ragtime is a genre most of us have heard of even nowadays in modern times. And that is all for today's video on ragtime. Hopefully this gave you a good introduction on the style, what it's supposed to sound like, and some of the influential people who developed ragtime and made it popular. And just a little like spoiler alert for the next video, we're going to be looking at one of Scott Joplin's songs as a tutorial, so this is kind of like in preparation of that. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, definitely make sure you subscribe and send this video a like and yeah without further ado i will catch you next time ah why that's the eraser that's the eraser Bych naberou tak něco. No ano, čas kážu ty. Čas kážeš mě. No ne, to je nechorší, to je nechorší. Привет, меня зовут Оля, и я из команды Яндекс Зен, блог платформа, которая платит блогерам за контент. Мы создали первый официальный. Сетки дом. И дом, мать песня. Вот бы и нам новый. Так шевелите лапами и в магнит. Совершайте покупки. Играйте в приложение или регистрируйте чек в чат-боте и выигрывайте дом. Поздравляю, Шарик, ты победитель. С новым домом, магнит. Позаботиться о близких так просто. Согласен? Растворимый цикорий, натуральный и вкусный продукт. Экологика, цикорий, это про здоровье. Утро должно быть бодрым. Но что делать, если постоянно мучают боли в суставах? Крем Долгит способен оказывать местные обезболивающие, противовоспалительные и противоотечные действия. И чтобы каждое утро могло начинаться без боли, используйте крем Долгит в желтой упаковке. Долгит. Доступная упаковка от 149 рублей. Скачайте мобильное приложение Яндекс.Маркет и покупайте эко-средства и подгузники Синергетик со скидкой до 60%. Выгодные покупки на Яндекс.Маркете. В эти праздники не забудьте поздравить свою главную половинку. Сумасшедшая среда в Киевсе. Два твистера по цене одного. Купон 5050. Команда ВТБ рекомендует навести камеру телефона на экран, ведь это реклама цифровых сервисов ВТБ. Которая поможет вам больше не платить комиссию за платежи и перевод. Даже если у вас другой банк. С карты на карту без комиссии ВТБ онлайн. Скачайте. Оплата штрафов без процентов? Экономить начинаете. Платить на ЖКХ и связь? Теперь для всех бесплатно. С сервисами ВТБ все так просто и понятно. Наводите карту, скачивайте ВТБ онлайн. И пользуйтесь бесплатными цифровыми сервисами банка прямо сейчас. ВТБ. Все получится. Легко. Пора бы и нам продуктами закупиться. Так шевелите лапами и в магнит. Сергей Лапинский вам поможет. 129.99. Новогодние скидки в магнит. Головная боль мешает активной жизни, примите Салбудейн Фаст. Благодаря растворимой форме он всасывается быстрее, помогая облегчать боль. Салбудейн Фаст. Направленное действие против разных видов головной боли. Бережное для желудка. Домашнее задание на завтра. Найдите мне самое выгодное ОСАГО. Уже нашла. В сервисе Сравнеру за две минуты можно купить или продлить свой полис ОСАГО с экономией до 3000 рублей. Если ОСАГО, то Сравнеру. Болят мышцы, а ты говоришь, боли нет. Пять активных компонентов капсикам способствуют облегчению боли. Капсикам – моя сила движения, экстра сила в новой упаковке. Нам не все равно, что в празднике ваши близкие далеко. Вы далеко от меня.
Забили мной другого дня, но даже время мне не сможет помешать. Новогодний экспресс работает по всей стране и привозит технику в подарок за два часа или к удобному времени. Нам не все равно, вам волшебно. Чего я хочу от работы? Мне недостаточно только зарплаты и премии. Хочу помогать людям. Хочу не только Понятно. слушать, но и слышать. Хочу работать в сильной команде. Я хочу большего, поэтому хочу работать в Сбере. Работа в Сбере для тех, кто хочет большего. Снова болит спина. Представляем Вольтарен. Его активный компонент обладает самой высокой противовоспалительной активностью среди аналогичных средств. Вольтарен – это не просто движение, это счастье быть вместе. Вольтарен – номер один назначаемый препарат от боли в мышцах и суставах. Представляем лечебный пластырь Вольтарен. Против боли один на 24 часа. Рар на прямой связи, прохладно на улице, газа российского нет и, скорее всего, не будет. Александр Глебович, если верить изданию Financial Times, официальный Берлин не верил в идею вторжения Путина на Украину, но американская администрация приложила усилия и Берлин убедила. Что это значит? Не нужно верить британским газетам, они пишут одно и то же. Не надо верить Bildzeitung в Германии, это в принципе про американская газета. В Германии с тревогой наблюдает за тем, что происходит на границе Донбасса, но в войну мало кто верит. Я думаю, что больше надежда на то, что Байден и Путин о чем-то договорятся. Я могу сказать, что даже один из очень влиятельных зеленых политиков, Третин, Сейчас говорит, что нужно с Россией уметь договариваться. И также целая группа э, экспертов по вопросам безопасности, старые немецкие генералы, подписали тоже общее письмо с тем, чтобы договориться, чтобы понять тоже точку зрения России, начать какие-то переговоры по Хельзинке-2. То есть Германия, Франция, я думаю, большинство европейских стран не подаются на, как мне кажется, все-таки фальшивые материалы, которые как-то на... Помните, начиналась Иракская война в 2002 году, тоже в ООН предоставили какие-то материалы о каких-то секретных оружиях Саддама Хусейна, потом оказывается все лажа. Было то же самое с выборами в Америке, когда именно те же самые британские, американские разведки, даже не слушая своих там начальников, уже выдавали какую-то информацию по поводу того, что вот Россия захватывает власть в Америке. И то же, то же самое сейчас, тут какая-то игра играется, которая не всем понятна. Едет в строковую за ОСАГО. Не надо тратить время. Оформи ОСАГО онлайн на платформе. Пилотлуги. Выбирай онлайн. Эконом 55%. Выбирай за несколько минут. Езжай куда хочется, а не за страховкой. Узнай больше на сайте пилотлуги.ру. Невозможно объяснить, Две что такое Две минуты мне что рекламу показали. Это что такое вообще? Ты должен увидеть, чтобы поверить. По Украину сделать нейтральной страной. Я вот сам эту идею все время подбрашиваю здесь. Мне говорят, что Запад не может пойти на это, потому что в обратном случае, если согласиться на нейтралитет Украины, Украина капитулирует и проигрывает Запад. Есть силы, которые это не хотят. Спасибо вам огромное, да, Александр Глебович Рар, на прямой связи да, из Германии.
Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. I am Alicia, and I am back from my break. So all of the videos that you've seen in the last month or so have been pre-recorded, but now I'm finally like back in real time again. Um, a little bit groggy with having a baby and all that. If you want to learn more details about that, definitely visit my vlog channel. But anyway, that's all an aside. So what today's video is about is the four stages of learning and why you think that you suck at piano. So the four stages of learning is a really interesting theory that I find um, really easy to apply and understand and hopefully it will give you a little bit of insight into your own piano journey. So we're going to go through each of the four stages one by one, talk about how it's relevant and then put it all together. So let's get started. In this theory, the four stages are as follows. You got number one, unconscious incompetence, which is you don't know what you don't know. We got number two, second stage, conscious incompetence, which is you know what you don't know. And then we have number three, conscious competence. You're pretty good, but you have to think about it. This is uh, you know what you know. And then finally, we have unconscious competence, which is you're good and you don't have to think about being good. You are on autopilot. What we're going to do is discuss each of these stages in more depth, which will hopefully give you a deeper understanding into your own learning process. It will also give you an idea on why you think that you're not good at piano, which is a trap that most adult beginners fall into, and it's a trap that often causes people to quit. The first stage is unconscious incompetence, or I don't know what I don't know. This is the beginning phase of learning any new skill. Everyone starts here with no exceptions. At this stage, you basically have no idea how to set goals for learning the skill, since you have no idea what to actually learn. You're completely in the dark and without a roadmap. At this stage, you're going to be making lots of mistakes, and even worse than that, you're not even going to know that you're making mistakes. So at this stage, a lot of beginners get really discouraged because they just, they're not sure why they can't do what they hear and just kind of take it personally, like they think it's because they're no good. And this is often a stage where you're gonna find beginners giving up or quitting. They may say, I wanna learn piano. They spend like a couple weeks trying it and then just completely give up because there's so much overwhelm and just you know feeling bad about themselves for not being able to do what they think they should be able to do. In piano, I see this manifesting in several ways. You might be uh, reading notes and rhythms incorrectly without realizing it. You might hear, or a student might hear me play their piece and say something like, how do you make it sound so much better than me? And one thing I might see is a lack of progress because the student can't hear or see the problem. Like maybe they're playing like the rhythm wrong, but they don't know. Brushing off a particular skill because they can't see how it matters, like a student ignoring scales or not practicing sight reading, it just seems superfluous. The important thing to realize here in stage one is that this is just all a part of the process and everyone goes through it. At first you might feel like you're just floating in outer space, but eventually you should start to develop a sense of getting your footing. You just have to be patient. If you're in this stage, it's also a really, really good idea to have a piano teacher. I, I say that anyway because I'm a piano teacher, so I have that bias, but it's, I think, especially critical in the very beginning because you won't be able to pinpoint the things that you're doing wrong at first unless I don't know, you're just like really, really self-aware, but it's hard for most people to do that. So piano teacher in the early stages is gonna help you avoid bad habits. Next is stage two, conscious incompetence, also known as I know what I don't know. In my opinion, this is the most challenging phase and where most people throw up their hands in the air and quit. This is where self-esteem plummets and people will declare, I suck at piano. See, at least when you're in the beginner phase, most people can, be a beginner and be comfortable being a beginner. Most people don't expect to know anything when they start out, so they're comfortable having a piano teacher show them the ropes. They feel okay with knowing very little. But the problem happens is when they start to become aware of their own shortcomings. At this point, the student can see the territory a little bit more clearly. They can tell that they're hitting notes wrong. They can tell that the rhythm's not quite right and maybe you know their musicality isn't where they hear that it should be. You can tell that all these mistakes are happening now. There's, it's like the light's been turned on to their shortcomings. And this can be extremely frustrating for the ego because you can see all of these problems, but you don't necessarily have the skills or knowledge to fix them. It's one thing to make mistakes and not know it, but it's another thing entirely to make mistakes and to know it. So that's why I think this is actually the most common stage for people to give up 
on learning their skill, such as piano, completely. Because it's in this stage where people tend to think that, oh, I'll never be able to do this. So stage one is the beginner stage, then this here, mm -hmm. stage two, would be the intermediate stage. Some common signs of stage two are the following. Mm -hmm. uh, the feeling that you're getting worse instead of getting better, since you notice so many mistakes. You're probably just making as many mistakes as you used to, but now you're actually noticing mm -hmm. them. A feeling of overwhelm, which is caused because the more you know, the more you realize there is to know. It, so it's not just about the the notes. You start to notice there's so much more musicality involved in playing the piano. There's all these little subtle shadings that you need to pay attention to. There's wanting to quit because the learning process seems so fast and you feel like you barely scratched the surface. You feel like you barely made any progress. Um, but on the positive side, there are a couple of good things that start happening here. You, you start to see the value in certain skills, like scales and sight reading. You, just, you start to see why they actually matter. And you're also, at this stage, able to practice more deliberately, since you're more able to pinpoint your weaknesses. You're not just you know, flailing around in the dark. If you find yourself in this stage, it's really, really important to not be too hard on yourself. And so remember, if you can tell that you're making mistakes, it means that you've already made significant progress along your learning journey. You're not, you know, at square one if you can tell that you are doing things wrong. Being able to observe your flaws is just a sign that lots and lots of growth is happening, and soon you're going to be able to move into that stage of confidence, which is stage three. Then we have stage three, or conscious confidence. This is where you do know what you know. So stage one is beginner and stage two is intermediate. Stage three could be considered the proficiency stage. You're finally competent, but this competence requires a lot of conscious effort. You have to work really hard to make your music sound good and you're probably still making a few mistakes. If you've ever worked really hard on a piece, gotten pretty good at it to the point where maybe even when you're playing through it, sometimes you can do it with no mistakes, but then you sit down to perform it, even if it's just for a friend or a family member, you completely bomb it then you know what stage three is like. Stage three is when you are good at something enough to be able to play it without mistakes sometimes, but not so good that you're on autopilot. Some features of stage three are being able to play something well, but only with lots of concentration and focus. Feeling like what you're playing is really challenging, really difficult. So this is something where I see students hold tension in their body, or they'll hold their breath in difficult passages. This is where you might start feeling stuck in your skills. And again, this is where, um, as a side note, I, I talk about piano teachers a lot because I am one, but this is where piano teachers are useful because they are able to objectively pinpoint what specific areas you need to work on in order to move on to the next level, which in this you know, model or theory would be level four. If you're in this stage, the best thing that you can do is practice deliberately and practice consistently. Consistent practice is obviously important because that's how you're gonna get to that point of being able to play an autopilot, but so is deliberate practice. So say for example, you're, you play a piece and you play it all the way through as your practice, but maybe there were a few spots when you played it all the way through that were mistakes. Maybe one spot is a little trill that you messed up, maybe another spot is a fast five note passage that you bombed. The tendency is to just kind of like play the whole piece through and say, eh, that's good enough, I'll stop now, as opposed to homing in on those little tiny micro issues, which is what you need to do in this phase to be able to pass into autopilot. And finally, we arrive at stage four, which is unconscious confidence. This stage can also be called mastery. It's, it's when your skills go on autopilot and they become effortless. At this point, you can play at a high level, kind of like stage three. Like stage three, you're already pretty good. But at stage four, you don't have all of the stress and strain that you have in stage three. Hitting stage four is when playing a piece or a scale or any other skill becomes truly freeing and enjoyable. You can kind of just sit back and let the magic happen. Some features of this stage are making very few mistakes, even under pressure, such as uh, performance. Uh, the stage four scale can be multitask. So if you're playing a piece and all of a sudden there's like a loud noise, it won't throw you off. It won't like make you have to restart completely. You can kind of focus even with a distracting background. Or if you're getting lost in your thoughts, you know, sometimes when you're playing, your mind starts to wander. You're less likely to 
veer off course if that happens to you. You understand what you're doing well enough to be able to teach it, and playing a particular skill, whether it's reading music, whether it's uh, playing something like a piece of music, it'll start to feel instinctual, not intellectual. The important thing to remember in stage four is that you can't just sit back and rest on your laurels. You can't learn... Yeah, <laughs> 